Hello level fours. I hope that this time is a time that you're going to use wisely, especially when now you are tuned in to just watch this English level four. Today I'm going to tackle a few topics that we find difficult to handle. Topics that we always question, we don't know how to write. One thing I must remind you is that in level four, you all know that you're going to write quite a lot. But we're going to start by talking about how we write with an opinion. You might wonder, why are we asking you to air your opinion? You're soon gonna go and work. You're soon gonna meet lots of people. People from different backgrounds, different culture, different schools of thoughts, they have their opinion, you have your opinion. Question is, how are you going to be able to navigate that? Are you going to be a pushover? Are you going to go and make people think, my opinion is the only one that counts? On the flip side of that, you're also going to find others that are feeling like, my opinion is the only correct one. Why are we talking about opinions? Most of the times we argue, we fight, we don't do the job well because of opinions. But let's see where it all starts. Why do we carry opinions? Let's look at why we should even write with an opinion. All this is because we are looking for a few things. One of those things is that we are trying to persuade people. We are trying to make them change the way they see things. We are trying to make them believe something else that they have not believed. That is where the persuade comes. Very rarely we will write because we want to argue. Most of the times we don't write because we want to argue. So that one you can put it in the bag. Arguing is rarely. And when you argue, then how are you arguing? And why are you arguing? It's because you're clashing with opinions. That is what, but mostly when we write, when we read, we read issues that are written in a discursive way. What do I mean by discursive? Because people are talking, people are sharing their point of view. A good writer or a good read is one that has got different kinds of opinions, where one person is not just saying, this is all that counts, but they're just thinking of the other person that is not them and trying to show how they would do it. Some people, we write because we want to reflect. What are we reflecting? We are reflecting of what we did, what we said, how we handled ourselves in public with other people. Because most of the times, people fight because of opinions. And lastly, when you write, or when you share, or when you talk, when you work with people, it is very important to be having a critical mind. Somebody who's got a critical mind will always think about what they're saying and they would always observe how it's making the other person feel, how it's making the other person think. They will also take time to listen. Why? Because you want to analyze what the other person is saying. Because your opinion is important, their opinion is important. Okay, enough talking. So when we write, when we read a lot of times good reads good uh, stories that we enjoy are those that are written subjectively i know you heard these words for the first time objectively and subjectively now when we use objective language everything is factual you do not talk about things that are not there you don't even add sugar and spice what do i mean by sugar and spice your own feelings your own ideas your own thoughts you just write according to how you see the situation. But we also can write emotively. When we write emotively, we are putting subjects. We are putting our own feelings. We are putting our own emotions to it. And that always makes a story beautiful. So let's see why we read. When we read, there are reasons why we read. Besides being a critical read, uh, person who thinks, we read things that are either informing us things that are persuading us. With inform comes education. So when you're informed, you're also educated. But also, are you an open person who wants to be educated? We also persuade people. We want to tell them, hey, stop looking at it that way. Look at it this way. And those are the people who we are able to change their minds. We also sometimes read to entertain or we write to entertain. We write to instruct, especially when you're putting together a recipe. 
or putting together instructions. What do you do? You're writing it down to instruct people. But there you would probably use a lot of objectivity. You would not use subjective. Then we also write to explain. We also write to describe. So today, before we look at how to write with an opinion, we are going to look at first how to write objectively. Two things come to mind. A news article, which you're going to do in your assignment two, and if you don't do it in your assignment two, you will do it in your paper two, internal and external. Now here we have lots of problems when we are marking, because most of you think, if I write a lot, then I will collect marks. If I write repetitively, I'm going to collect marks. I have news for you, you don't collect marks by writing repetitively and wrong. My theory is this, when you write, write four, using only four paragraphs. What do I mean by four paragraphs? We definitely need a catchy title. So what is a catchy title? Let me try and write one catchy title here. I hope it will catch your mind. So for example, one title that you could use is Why did I pick this topic? Because soon, when you finish level four, you will be a jobless graduate. That's not a bad thing. That is definitely why you are at school. Because soon you want to graduate, and after you graduate, you would like to look for a job. So, that is a very catchy title. So if you have a very nice, interesting title, it is one that is going to make people want to read that. Now they're all curious. Why jobless graduate? What could be in this story that has got jobless graduate? Now when you're looking at an article, whether magazine or newspaper, it is always very objective. What do I mean? Very factual. You're going to share facts. And with these facts, it doesn't limit you to a little bit of emotive words. But we were still talking about the paragraphs. Four lovely paragraphs. In your introduction, that's paragraph number one. Then we have body. The body you need two paragraphs where you will air your views. You are going to talk about why the jobless graduates need to take note. And then the last one, which is paragraph number four. It is the conclusion one where you draw back all the thoughts, all your arguments, where you try to convince your reader this is why you're talking to jobless graduates. So if you feel that you're a writer, you like talking too much, you have lots to share, you can add another paragraph in your body, three paragraphs. But more than five paragraphs is writing quite a lot and it will not get you marks. All you're going to do, you're just going to be going round and round the circles. So, historical questions. Historical questions are others that are really provocative. Uh, they create that critical thinking. They make somebody think. They make people wonder what's going on. But now, what is a critical, uh, historical question? A historical question is one where you don't give an answer. You are leaving it out there for the reader to have lots of answers. And you make them start thinking because probably they had not thought about it that way. Remember what we said, when we read, when we write, we are trying to persuade people. We are trying to make them think otherwise. We are trying to inform them. And as we inform them, we allow them to think and to understand that which they had not properly thought about. So now, let us look at an example of what I mean by a few emotive language uh, words that you could add there. This is a sentence. It says, when the mother saw her long lost child again, her heart was overflowing with joy. Now, when you look at one like this one, let us try and find the emotive language words with me. I'm giving you only five seconds where I would like you to just try and find them before I give you the answer. The five seconds begin now. I bet you have found them. So let me help you here. What we are going to do is we are going to highlight what I think should have been, and I suppose you also thought the same. So I would, let's choose green. I would say this is one of those, even though not quite child. Let's remove the child. Let's begin that again. It is the long lost, 
Long lost gives you that picture that this is a long time ago. But what does it do to the reader? It makes you go way back and you're thinking, hmm, five years, two years, five, we never know. Another one that stands out is here, overflowing with joy. These are some of the emotive words I'm saying when you're writing an article, but we don't put so many of them. We always use a few. So moving right along, that is about articles which are objective language. Let's go back to what we were talking about, writing with an opinion. But before we move so far writing with an opinion, I would like to test you a little bit and see whether you have really understood what I have just been talking about. And that is, I want you to look at this. I've got a few sentences here. I want you to find emotive words. And once you find the emotive words, you underline them or you figure them out. And then you choose. Is it in a subjective language or objective language? This shouldn't take you more than 30 seconds. 30 seconds is a long time. Starting now. I think 30 seconds are up and you definitely have an idea of what's going on. So before we look at the answers, I want you just to look at, for example, the one, the first one. People who are late for work are lazy and irresponsible. Do you agree with that opinion? Imagine someone comes and says, you're late for work again, which means you're lazy and irresponsible. You see, this is what we are talking about. Opinions can actually change character. Opinion can make people argue. But here are some of my answers that I chose, and I know there's one or two that we are going to argue about, but let's first look at these ones. True, lazy and irresponsible is one of those. That is definitely a subjective language where you're using your emotions because other people might not look at it that way. And definitely it is a subjective language. Number two, everyone really had a wonderful time at the party. Really? Does it mean everybody had a wonderful time? Some people could have been bored and that is where their opinion comes in. That's somebody's opinion. Not doesn't necessarily mean it goes for everybody. The other one that is straightforward is human beings have five fingers on each hand. We all know that. That's a fact. We don't even need to add anything to that. The next one, the sight of the moonlight glittering on the dark water entranced me. Glittering. We focus on the word glittering. Some people might not find it as glittering. Some people might just think it is the moon. So that is one person feeling like it is glittering and hence it entrances me. Others might just look at it and think, mm, it's the moon, it's shining. So, but the last one, the sight of dirty washrooms and frayed bedroom carpets made me long for home. We say this is an objective one, factual. Why do we say that? It is factual because you're describing exactly what you saw. When you open the door, the rooms were dirty. When you look down on the carpet thinking it was going to be soft, fluffy, it wasn't any of those. That is why it is objective. So you need to be careful to find which words are evoking emotions. Which words are making you feel like, hey, that's not very good to say. And why are they saying that? I could be thinking of something different. Right. Let's go to now the juicy part where it is really writing with an opinion. This is something else that you're going to write, editorial or a news column. Now, this two are strictly opinionated, subjective language. When a columnist or an editor writes a piece, they are writing to their, their own view, not anybody else's, their own view. But there's something that stands out about them. They write, first of all, what they see around, what they hear, what they read. So it could be a social issue. 
It could be a political issue. It could be an economical issue. Around you, there are always things that are happening. How often do you take note of that? How often do you make an opinion on what you see? And just remember, it's not only you who is making an opinion of what you see. There are so many of us. So, a columnist writes a column, and they all write for a newspaper or a magazine, and an editor writes in a newspaper, or an, and they edit what they have seen. So, let's see some of the characteristics of these two. Although they write with an opinion, they definitely, first of all, use facts. They first see exactly what is happening. They capture those memories, those moments, and then they decide or have an opinion about it. Then they decide, I'm going to share it with the world. This is how I see it. But you know what is so beautiful about it? When a columnist or an editor writes, they expect you to respond. How many of us read? How many take an interest in reading magazines and newspapers? Nowadays we've gone digitally. When you surf that internet, what do you look for? Do you read about what's going on? And once you read it, do you have an opinion about it? Because this is where you come in. You can respond to what the editorials write. You can ex respond to what you read in the newspapers or what you watch on TV. Now, same thing for exam purposes. Same thing like I said, you write lots, which doesn't make sense. Remember, when you are responding, you are also responding to share your own opinion. So, four paragraphs, I cannot stress that hard much enough. Or five, if you feel you have so much to write. More than five paragraphs is a little bit too much. And all you're going to do, you'll be writing back and forth. I'm stressing that again. So editorials, as well, when they write, they are also cautious because they know they are representing a newspaper or a magazine. Remember, we are going to be looking for jobs. And once you get a job, I'm sure now you're wondering, why must I learn about articles? Why must I learn about columnists? Why must I actually even know how to write as an editor? Listen, when you find a job, the, 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 the boss might send you or your department might send you somewhere on a course or to go and represent their company on something, when you come back, they expect you to write something about it. How are you going to write it? Are you going to write it objectively, or are you going to use your opinion? Now, when you are writing, you are writing for the, lo not the local, but for your work magazine, or your ma work newspaper, or every company has got a way of airing or sharing what they're doing and the progress and the projects. This is where you come in. This is why we teach you how to write these things. So if it is an article, then you know you're going to use factual language. If it is an editorial or you're just making your observations and maybe they tell you, share a little bit of how you felt, then you know you're going to go to, as a columnist or as an editor where you're going to air your views. However, do not forget to use facts. You have to be based on facts and not just what you think. And why would you be writing this? Even if you're writing it for a company, you're writing because you want other workmates to be able to realize and learn that putting yourself out there to go on a course or to go on a conference, it is always worth it because you learn quite a lot and you're persuading their opinion and your be their beliefs and school of thoughts. Now, I have something here for you to exercise. Look at this sentence. It says, something utterly horribly happened while the whole world was focusing on Oscar Pistoria trial. Now, this information, may I just let you know, most of it I collected it from our textbooks. We use future managers textbooks. I also added a little bit of Macmillan textbooks, but all level fours, they've got the same subject line. So if you find this statement, it's not because it is my own making is what I found. So what do I want you to do with this uh, sentence? I want you to read it. It will take you five seconds. When you read it, ask yourself, is this for an editorial column or is this as an article? Starting now. So, let's work it out together. This one, no matter what you say, and I know it was easy, we are going to definitely call it. 
it's worthy an article do you agree with me absolutely not it is not an article why is it not an article let me show you why it's not an article look at this utterly horrible whatever it may have been how do we know it was so bad some people might not think it was so bad others might think actually focusing on oscar pretorius trial is the most horrible thing so what do we call this definitely this is an editorial piece an editorial piece where we have feelings we have opinions and this person is definitely feeling like what i saw was more horrible than you watching Oscar's pistorius trial so moving along now everything that you read everything that you write goes to some form of media now media is a very powerful tool that we deal with and it's the same as when you open your mouth to speak it goes out there to the public now the opposite of that when you write when you read it's all from media now we have various kinds of medias we have print media which is newspapers and magazines then we have audio visual media which is such as television because we can hear and we can see we've got videos and we've got DVD recordings now they're not so popular but anyway they're there we also have got things like podcasts and all that but then we go to electronic media which is the most popular one now electronic media has taken over the world so there are people doing internet text we've got websites that we surf on we've got video clips that we watch and all that but all this come with some form of caution now some of the things that the media does it's got it's got some its own elements besides the fact that it is there to persuade and above all to manipulate the question is you as the one who is listening watching reading how much control do you have how strong are you not to be persuaded or how strong are you not to be able to be manipulated manipulation is the biggest of them all now let's see some of the ways that you're manipulated or persuaded we've got issues such as biasness and prejudice now prejudice is where you prejudge in this world are we not like that we are always walking around judging and everything you see you judge everything you read you judge everything you hear you judge the other thing is when you are biased, you're one-sided. You only look at it from one angle. Just because this is what is comfortable for you, that is what you do. And media is very good at doing that. It showcases everything that will force you to either prejudge or be biased. Another thing is stereotyping. How often do we stereotype? We stereotype because we want to feel like when we stereotype, we have an opinion. Now, some of the things we do when we stereotype is that we take the individual and we put them in a group. And when you put them in a group, sorry about that highlighting, but at least you get the idea. When you put them in a group, you say this is where you belong. This is how I see you. And especially, that is where you find that we have got this cyber bullying and internet bullying. Because many people like that. They like putting people in boxes. But you don't even take the note of that individual. May I just stress individual? Then how do we do this? Using the emotive language, it's coming back. Opinions, emotive language is all about opinion. So we have connotations and denotion. So connotation goes very hand in hand with emotive words. Let me first take some of this. I want you to have a clear view. So, when we have connotations, it refers to the emotive words that you throw out there. Many people speak to you with a connotation. What do we mean? They speak to you, but they don't actually voice exactly what they're trying to say to you. And then when you go like, what do you mean? They again reword it, they change it. That's 
or to do with the emotive language. But when you speak with a denotion, you speak literally things as they are. That is why the scientists and the mathematicians win at this, because you cannot change one plus one equals to two. But with words, and that's where the English language comes in, we change a lot. But when you're reading some stuff, there are some other things that we do. We omit and we select. Remember what I said? We start from factual. Once we start with facts, what do we do? From factual, we add our emotive words. So we find a situation, we know this is what has happened in this situation, then we choose to, I will omit that one, I will add this, I will add this, remove that, and then eventually that's why you find people saying, that's not exactly what happened when they view something on the radio. But in all this, what are we trying to do? We are trying to persuade. And there are three ways we persuade. And I would like you to take note of these three words. Lagos, pathos, and ethos. You can see the explanation there. When you use lagos, you use logic to convince people to change their minds. When you say pathos, emotions. You tap into their emotions. When you talk about ethos, you're looking for a credible person, like Nelson Mandela. And having said all that, I want you to have a look at this very quickly before our time really runs out. And you see what media has done to us. This is what media has done. Most of the times, because this is where we spend our time, Look at in 2019, 60 minutes what people do. In just one minute, look at what they do. Statistics are there, they show. You can see that majority of the people spend their time, and this is where you will come in, you will spend your time emailing. Look at how many emails are sent in one minute, 188 million. And then if you're not doing that, you are on WhatsApp. Nowadays, some companies have also started WhatsApp um, groups because they communicate using WhatsApp. That is another way that people are doing. But as much as we would like to believe Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are big, those two are the biggest. But why would you think email will overtake WhatsApp? It's because at work, people communicate using emails and it is the safest and most trusted. Finally, in conclusion, Propaganda is a big one when it comes to media. What is propaganda? It is the type of language that you use to persuade people to change their minds. But propaganda is dangerous because it is manipulative and it gives false information. For example, when they want you to vote, what do they do? They use manipulation. What do we call that? Propaganda. But why do they do that? Because they know with one sentence and one line, you can change your mind. Having said that, I would like just to conclude by reminding you, the media is a very powerful tool. And besides the media being powerful, what you write, what you say is very important. Use critical minds. And when you write, not more than four paragraphs. We'll see you again in the next lesson, and I'll share a little bit more. I trust that you learned one thing or two.